Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Well, today, Advent 4, we come to the last part of my sermon series, the Lord's Prayer. And so the title of my sermon, again, here you see it, And When You Pray, Part 4. Same picture, people sitting in the church praying, and I pray that this sermon and this series will encourage you to say the Lord's Prayer. When the disciples came to Jesus and asked them to teach them how to pray, it's amazing they didn't ask him to teach them how to walk on water, how to do miracles. They asked him how to pray. And he said, look, if you're going to learn how to pray, there's three attitudes that you've got to deal with. Number one, don't be like a hypocrite. Don't be showing off when you're praying. Secondly, when you pray, go into your room, pray in secret. In other words, you need to guard your heart from false motives. And thirdly, don't keep babbling and um, just saying lots of words. God knows what you need even before you pray it. And then he taught them this prayer. And as I've taught you over these last uh, four weeks, he gave them this prayer in four parts. The invocation, the petitions towards God, the petitions towards ourselves, and then finally the doxology, which is what we're going to look at today. The invocation was our Father. This is personal. He's in heaven. He's transcendent, but he's also on the earth. He's imminent. He's here. He's everywhere. The petitions to God, holy is your name. You're absolutely sovereign and holy. Your kingdom come. We want to embrace God's kingdom on the earth, not the worldly kingdom. We want to live on the earth, but we want to live in his kingdom. The already, not yet. Your will be done on earth. Well, in order to break, embrace the kingdom of God, you've got to be willing to do his will. So we want his will to be done. We relinquish our wills and we invite the kingdom of God onto the earth. And then the petitions towards us, please give us our daily bread. Careful, we don't get greedy, just what we need for today. Forgive us our sins. And he reminded us, if you don't forgive others, don't ask God to forgive you. And lead us not into temptation. Please protect us from ourselves when we get into compromising situations because of our own fallen brokenness. Well, today we come to the doxology. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Well, the first thing you'll notice about this part of the prayer is it's not actually recorded in the readings of Matthew's Matthew that we've been reading these last three weeks. It's not actually written in the text. And I know what you're going to say. Well, if it's not in the Bible, I'm not going to pray it. Well, good on you. That's the sort of attitude you should take. But don't, don't, don't jump too quickly because these are biblical principles that we will find in other parts of Scripture. So we can still pray that. Let's have a look at them very quickly. Yours is the kingdom. Now, if you do a quick word count, you'll find that the word kingdom is mentioned 65 times in the New Testament alone. And we read uh, in Luke, Luke records this, Jesus' interaction with the Pharisees, once on being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, the coming of the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed, nor will people say here it is or there it is, because the kingdom of God is in your midst. That's Luke chapter 17, verses 20 and 21. The kingdom of God is actually in your midst, Wherever Jesus is, that's where the kingdom is. Wherever God is, that's where the kingdom is. The kingdom was right there where Jesus was standing. 
And the kingdom is in our midst as well because the Holy Spirit's living inside us. The kingdom's here. When Paul wrote to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 4, 18 to 20, he was chiding some of them. He said, some of you have become arrogant as if I were not coming to you, but I will come to you very soon if the Lord is willing. And then I will find out not only how these arrogant people are talking, but what power they have. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. The kingdom of God is not about words. It's about the power of God. God being able to do things in you and me that no other human being can create. I'm talking about those qualities like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. You can't conjure them up. Only God and his power can create them in you. When Paul wrote to the Roman church, he said to the Italians, the kingdom of God is a matter of righteousness, joy and peace in the Holy Spirit. You see, this power that God has enables us not just to be healed. He enables us to change our character. He enables us to change us from the inside out. He enables us to be transformed. That's the most powerful force in the universe. So first thing I want to just quickly say is that when we pray yours is the kingdom, it's sort of like we're pointing to the fact that God is omnipresent. He's everywhere. And because he's everywhere, he can do all of these things. Here's my first slide. Have a look at this slide. I've written here, when you pray, remember that God's kingdom is here. Pay attention to it. See the picture of this man watching this meteor sitting over the city? There's the sky, the meteor, the little town the mountains, the creation. The kingdom of God is everywhere and we should pay attention to it because God is omnipresent. Yours is the kingdom, the whole kingdom. It's all his. He's everywhere. We need to pay attention to it. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the power. Now, when the Sadducees came to Jesus and test him about resurrection and this woman had been married to different men and they were trying to trick him. He responded, you are in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. He said that to the Sadducees, the religious leaders. And of course, when we come to the Psalms, sing to God. This is Psalm 68, verse 32. Sing to God your kingdoms of the earth. Sing praise to the Lord, to him who rides across the highest heavens, the ancient heavens, who thunders with mighty voice. Proclaim the power of God, whose majesty is over Israel, whose power is in the heavens. We read many places that God is infinitely powerful. And we have that God living directly inside of us. Think of the implications. A God who's even more powerful than a volcano is living inside of us. Yours is the power. Now, that's a way of sort of reminding us that God is omnipotent. He's infinitely powerful. And just quickly, I want to show you this slide. Here's the next slide. This is a picture of St. Helens when it was exploding. I've written here, when you pray, remember that the all-powerful God lives inside you. God, who is more powerful than a universe, lives inside you and he is omnipotent. He is infinitely powerful. When you pray, remember that. We come to this part of the prayer, yours is the glory. Yours is the kingdom, yours is the power, yours is the glory. Actually, if you come to church on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, you'll hear my sermons on the message of the angels, which talks about God's glory. We read in Luke chapter 2 and verse 9, when the angel appeared to the shepherds, the angel said uh, to them, um, 
he gave them a message and we read that the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified because of this glory of the Lord. Then a whole host of angels appeared to the shepherds and we read they said glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favour rests. The angels testified to God's holiness, greatness and supreme sovereignty. He knows everything. He's glory itself, absolutely holy. And when we say yours is the glory, that's a way of sort of reminding us that God is omniscient. He knows everything. He is absolutely perfect and glorious. Here's my next slide. Have a look at this. And when you pray, remember who you're talking to. God is absolutely sovereign. This is a picture of the world's third fastest uh, supercomputer. This is the National Nuclear Security Administration's newest uh, supercomputer. And it's been designed to um, serve as a, a nuclear security laboratory, laboratories um, security system. Well, God's even smarter than a supercomputer. He knows absolutely everything. And I want you to remember that when you're talking to God, the God you're talking to is absolutely sovereign. When you pray, remember who you're talking to. God is absolutely sovereign. And finally, the last part of the Lord's Prayer is now and forever. This part of the Lord's Prayer reminds us of the timelessness of God and our future. It's a doxology. It's the worship of God. It reinforces the fact that God is eternal. And remember that God is independent of time and space forever. When Paul wrote to Timothy, 1 Timothy 1.17, Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honour and glory forever and ever. Amen. The writer to the Hebrews, chapter 13, verse 20, Now may the God of peace who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, an eternal covenant. You have been given the gift of eternal life by a God who is eternal forever and ever. Now note this, you haven't been given everlasting life. You've been given eternal life. Everlasting life is life that keeps on going. We've been given eternal life. After we die, it's not going to be the same life as we've got on earth. No suffering, no pain. Always worshipping our Lord. There's a difference between everlasting and eternal. We've got eternal lives, so remember that. So I try to find an omni word. If we recognise... Uh, that God is omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, well then we also recognise that he is omnicontinuous. Look, here's my last slide. And when you pray, remember that you have an inheritance of eternal life. Here's a picture of a spiral staircase. It sort of represents eternity, if you like. I'd hate to climb those stairs. But... It's a symbol of eternal life. Remember this, when you pray that you have an inheritance of eternal life. So when you come to the Lord's Prayer, my prayer is that Jesus taught us this prayer. This is how to pray. Really, it should be the disciples' prayer. This is the prayer that we should be praying. I pray that you will discipline yourself to pray it as you think about it. Don't just pray it without thinking. Contemplate, meditate this prayer every time you say it. Our Father in heaven, 
hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Remember that the kingdom of God is close at hand. <laughs>